So in chapter 41, uh, the book titles it Species Interactions. I like to refer to it as Community Ecology. In chapter 40, it was about populations, and now we're moving up to uh, communities. And so really what we're looking at are ecological interactions uh, between the populations of different species. So kind of how different populations live together um, and how they interact. And so this would fall under the category of different biotic things. And so biotic is living. So here, uh, sorry, if you could make two sets of eight boxes, actually. All right, so what is a community? So here you have a population of frogs, uh, you have a population of flies, um, and how they interact is part of a, a community. Here's two different populations. One is a predator and one is a prey. But you also have um, plants are part of the community. So now how do the frogs like use those plants as a resource? Well, here they use them for camouflage and for hiding. Um, but then they also use them hiding. The frogs themselves are prey for foxes. And so a community makes up all the different populations and how they interact together. Um, and it's not just predator-prey relationships, but um, uh, how the different uh, resources, like uh, these plants here, are used by the frogs, etc. So a biological community is a group of populations of different species living close enough together to interact. Um, and how an organism interacts with individuals of other species in the community are called interspecific interactions. So here we're looking at other species, so like the frogs and the flies, that's an inter-specific interaction. Okay, um, and so this includes when we look at um, a community, it could, and the way populations interact, you have competition between um, individuals like the fox and the mountain lion, we're both competing for frogs. Um, you have predation, predator-prey relationships, herbivory, like what herbivores are going to eat those plants, symbiosis, and facilitation. Okay, so here we have the frogs and the flies. Um, when we look, okay, so you have a predator-prey relationship, but now the frogs are competing with the chameleons for, fly, for flies, right? So in this type of interaction, oh, I'm sorry, there's also competition. I think that's what that is showing. There's competition for resources within a community. Um, so what is a community? That goes in your box one. So here is my husband and I on one of our first camping trips, or major backpacking trips. This is up in the mountains of Colorado. And so you can see um, that this community here has a lot of pine trees. There was actually lots of rabbits um, and animals. You can see a lot of uh, like poop on the ground. That's actually from uh, rabbits. Uh, but here, when we look at this community, um, the trees only grew so high uh, because the air was so thin that the carbon dioxide wasn't enough to actually support plant life. So here we are, or here he is, up above tree line. Um, and so you can see where the trees kind of stopped growing over here. Um, and so when we look at this, we could actually have two different communities. One that kind of lives within the trees and one that lives within the grassland area of this mountain. Um, so there's just a lake. Uh, so when we look at this, this is an actual... Um, this is a marmot that only lives above uh, a certain elevation, and so it would live in like the more grassland community. Okay, so now here you have competition. Uh, in competition, like this mouse is going to be prey. So an in interspecific, that's when two different species are going to be competing. And so here, uh, it's kind of like a lose-lose because they're both struggling to uh, get the food, like they're competing against each other. So as we look at different interactions, we're going to see um, plus and minus signs. And with this negative negative, it's it's hard for both populations to find food. So with interspecific competition, uh, like an owl and a skunk may compete for the mice in that community. Um, and so individuals of different species compete for resource that limits their growth and survival. So this owl population, depending on how many mice they catch, will limit or determine how big that population grows and how it survives. So when we look at competition, the population size, um, if we have two species competing, uh, species A exists by itself and it's only competing with itself, its own members, you would end up with a graph like this, logistic growth. Eventually, you'd reach carrying capacity. However, if you introduce a second species, uh, species B, also living by itself in the community, would um, also do very well. 
However, if you have them, two populations using the exact same resource at the same time, um, you're going to have competition. And one of the species is going to be better at competing than the other. And so in this situation, species A uh, thrives and species B eventually um, the population sizes decrease, decrease, and may have to emigrate to find resources in another place, or they go extinct. Okay, um, so the inferior competitor is locally eliminated, whether through emigration or death. All right, and so we call this competitive exclusion. So when you have two different species or two different populations competing, uh, one of them is going to be ex competing for the same resource, sorry. Uh, one of them will be excluded from that area. Okay, so that's your box two, competitive exclusion. Now here we have a cute little burrowing uh, owl. It actually builds its nests underground. Um, and so if you think about like what abiotic factors does this burrowing owl require in life? Well, it would require a certain type of soil to like burrow into. Um, it would require certain temperatures um, and maybe amounts of rainfall. Uh, if it was too rainy in this area, their homes would always flood. Right? Um, and now for biotic factors, well, what food does it have available to it? Um, what kind of grass grows in the area to make roots? Um, like that would affect how they dig underground. Uh, who are their predators? Who eats their eggs or their babies? Uh, who do they compete with? Those would all be a, sorry, biotic factors. So when we look at how this owl lives, when we take into consideration both its abiotic factors and its requirements as far as temperature, rainfall, um, like shelter availability, as well as its biotic factors, so its place in the food web, um, who are its predators, who are its competitors, uh, what diseases are there, all of that together we call a niche. Um, and so an ecological niche or niche, I don't know which one is totally correct to say, uh, so that makes up the owl's um, niche. It's like place in life. <laughs> Uh, so, if you want to go ahead and summarize about that in box three. All right, so now can two species occupy the same niche at the same time and use the exact same resources if this was a different species? Could they both survive using everything exactly the same? Uh, no, because of competitive exclusion, one species is going to be better at getting those resources than the other species. And so no two species can ever occupy the exact same niche. Now, maybe they have the same food source, the same temperature requirements, but maybe they just live in different habitats. Maybe the new oranger owl maybe lives in trees instead of the ground, and that would reduce competition uh, for shelter. Okay, so um, what happens, we call this, so like, let's say there's a tree right here with some ants that live on this tree. And then there's a lizard species that is going to eat these ants. Now, if there's two different lizard species and they're both competing for the same food, um, it would be very difficult for both populations to survive, right? And so um, with this, uh, what will happen is something called resource partitioning. These lizard populations will actually evolve to share the resource um, rather than one of them going extinct. And so here, it's kind of like a Disney Fast Pass where you're sharing the ride, but you have different lines to reduce competition, kind of. Um, but anyway, so species have evolved to share resources in the wild. Otherwise, one of the species would die out. So um, when they divide a niche to avoid competition, we call this resource partitioning. Um, okay, so that is box four. What is resource partitioning and how does it relate to the species niche? Now what we have though, uh, you have the fundamental niche versus the realized niche. So here we have two different species living on one tree. If one species was gone though, this more gray lizard uh, species would cover the entire tree. It wouldn't have any competition and it would live and fill the entire tree. However, with competition, um, it will actually prefer the trunk of the tree rather than up in the branches. And you notice right here, I have the lizard population actually decreasing in size, and that's due to intraspecific competition. The lizards themselves are gonna be competing for food. So here, uh, when you have actual competition, you get what's called a realized niche. Um, is what kind of like when you take into account other populations and how everything interacts together, um, you have where they end up basically. 
Okay, so the difference between a species fundamental niche and realized niche is your box five. Ooh, predator-prey relationships. So when we have predation, so here you have a wasp eating a fly, um, an owl eating a little, I think a squirrel, or maybe a chipmunk or something. Uh, you have a hyena eating a zebra head. <laughs> um, so with predator-prey relationships, uh, you want to think about, well, what adaptations do the prey have to defend themselves against predators, right? How do they prevent getting eaten? And so with this, one could be camouflage. We call that cryptic coloration. And so you have defensive adaptations of prey. Um, and so here you see a fish, a rockfish in the ocean. Oh, this previous one was a butterfly. Um, and then you have a posmatic coloration. I'm not totally sure how you say that. Now, um, so you could either count the animals have evolved to either camouflage or with aposmatic coloration, it's like saying, you know what, I'm poisonous. Uh, so I'm brightly colored and you could choose to eat me or not, but if you eat me, you're going to have troubles. And so, um, brightly colored warnings also is a way to defend themselves against, um, predators because it's like warning the predators, hey, I'm poisonous. Um, so here, uh, this is a picture from when I was in, I think, Belize. So these are actually bats on a tree, uh, that are pretty camouflaged into the bark of the tree. Uh, and then here's also in Belize, uh, we were on a little boat in a river, and this, here you can see a crocodile just hanging out on the log, so it's also pretty camouflaged with the bark of that tree. Uh, so compare, contrast, cryptic coloration and aposmatic coloration. And that's your box six. Now we have other types of um, defense. Instead of like camouflage, we have mimicry. So here you have two butterflies, and even though they look the same, this bottom one is actually different. It has two little black dots. So the top butterfly is a monarch butterfly that's poisonous. And birds have learned that when they eat the butterfly, it tastes really bad and they vomit it up. Now this bottom butterfly actually has evolved to mimic the monarch. The bottom butterfly is not poisonous. And so therefore, uh, it just looks like a poisonous one. And so the predators, the birds, avoid it. So it survives, even though it's not a bad tasting butterfly. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I had those reversed. The top one is harmless, the bottom one is um, the poisonous monarch butterfly. So here you actually have, uh, this is like actually a little caterpillar um, on one side, and it mimics a, a tree snake. So it actually will puff up when it's in danger, and um, then the birds and things think, ooh, that's a little snake, and it avoids it, even though it's just a caterpillar. Um, so we call this Bateson mimicry, and this is when a harmless or palatable, means like good tasting, species mimics a harmful or unpalatable species. Now in Mullerian mimicry, uh, here you have a couple different kinds of wasps or um, bees, like insects that are both black and yellow. And so in this one, uh, by natural selection, they've evolved to all be black and yellow because if like a predator maybe is going to get honey or something like that and it gets stung by a bee that's black and yellow, well, the next time it sees something that's black and yellow, um, it will avoid it. So this is kind of like a group defense. Um, okay. So Mullerian mimicry is when two or more unpalatable, meaning like not good tasting uh, species, resemble uh, each other. And that is your box seven to compare and contrast the two types of mimicry. Okay, uh, herbivory. So here we have lots of animals on earth that are herbivores. So plants have actually evolved defenses uh, to prevent herbivores from eating them. So when we look at the difference between plants and prey, prey have a way to escape. They have legs or fins and they can swim, run, or fly away, whereas plants are rooted in place. So plants, some defenses that they have is they've evolved spikes as a way to um, protect themselves from being eaten, especially in the desert where cactus are going to um, store so much water. Uh, we also have hot peppers. Uh, that Caspian spice inside the hot peppers is a deterrent to herbivores, so they don't eat those. Um, or they could be poisonous, like poinsettias are actually poisonous plants. Um, and so with herbivory, it's like a win for the predator or the herbivore and then the loss for the plant. But they've evolved some defenses against um, too many herbivores. Okay, And that one's not really a box. Okay. 
And then in class, I guess we'll have to start with symbiosis.